we have a new free book for Human Action Podcast listeners, Dr. Guido Holzman's How Inflation Destroys Civilization. Learn how inflation isn't only making us poorer, it's harming our culture, mental well-being, and the moral foundations of civilization itself. Get your free copy today at mises.org slash HAPod free. This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Brian, welcome back to the Human Action Podcast. It's great to be back. So you are a jack of many trades. You're the executive editor of Mises.org, but also uh, I recently saw a talk you had given, I guess, at Oklahoma State University and we're basically just going to walk through the, the content of that. But so can you just give the backstory as to how did you end up there giving a talk on secession? Sure. Well, back in February, I had done a debate uh, at students, uh, the Student for Liberty, Liberty Con uh, conference that they were kind enough to invite me to do. Mm. And that was just a short debate, though. I really only had 20 minutes of prepared remarks. And then there was another 25 minutes or so of back and forth. Uh, with the other person, who was this activist from the Libertarian Party who was anti-secession. And so uh, I imagine at the end of that, one of you admitted, yes, I've been wrong. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> well, it was, certainly wasn't me, uh, yeah. I, although I don't recall uh, uh, being officially declared the winner or anything like that. Nevertheless, um, the head of students of the Free Enterprise Society at Oklahoma State University uh, liked the debate. And uh, so asked me to uh, to come and, and deliver basically a guest lecture at OSU. And uh, whereas uh, the distinction between the two talks, they're very different, whereas one was geared, the debate was geared to our specific audience. And there was very little time to go into a lot of the specifics and the quotations and and the scholarship behind secession, whereas at the OSU talk, I had considerably more time to do that. So there's a lot more theoretical, mm -hmm. historical information that goes into the OSU talk. And so they're definitely two different uh, presentations. Okay, great. And just to put it on uh, our audience's radar, so we're recording this by the time yeah, you, you'll see this a pretty fast story. By the time everyone sees this, it will still be true that next week, Ryan, I'm actually going to be at OSU, I think, giving a total of three talks that kind of jam-packed in there while I'm, I'm going to be there. And so I'm sure one or more of those will end up on you know the Mises.org YouTube channel if, if people are interested. Uh, even if you're not interested, it will end up on the Mises.org YouTube channel. So right. why don't we? Uh, <laughs> what I liked, Ryan, about your talk, joking aside, is we talk a lot about secession and certainly as with Americans, everything is always, well, how does this affect us? You know, that's like the uh, planet Earth basically consists of the United States and some other people that maybe annoy us or whatever um, enter the news cycle once in a while. So I liked that you were not merely focused on U.S. secession, but in, in general, you know, just around the world. So that was an, an interesting uh, break from the, the typical discussion. Let me just start it out. Um, having said all that, I am going to bring it back to the U.S. In, in this sense. One point you made early on in your talk that I thought was interesting is you distinguished like Mises' classical liberal approach to this topic from that of John C. Calhoun. And um, do you remember what I'm talking about or do I need to oh, jog yeah. your memory? Okay, okay, yeah. So can you just explain that distinction? Because I think a lot of people just assume like, oh yeah, if somebody supports secession, it must be because they were basically coming up with some excuse to defend U.S. slavery. And obviously that's, so go ahead. The the distinction about the liberals, that is the classical liberals, people like Ludwig von Mises, um, and pe most people we call today libertarians, is they tend to take an approach to uh, secession that's very broad. And you can find this going back to John Locke. Jefferson, obviously, was a secessionist, as you can read in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, you find it in many 19th century uh European liberals, and then of course you see it all the way up in libertarian terms through both Ludwig von Mises and Murray Rothbard. And but these guys, they they supported uh, secession on the principle of self determination. That is that people and groups they have this right to separate from a regime that uh, that any individual or group may feel is violating their human rights, their property rights. And that's basically the argument made in the Declaration of Independence. I note 
the reason I bring up Calhoun is to note that not everyone who supports secession does so for liberal reasons. Um, Calhoun did not support a general idea of self-determination. He supported a contractual right to secession. He felt that the states were in this contract with the, the federal government. And when the federal government ceased to do what it was supposed to do, that the state governments could secede. But this was based largely on legal and contractual rights. Calhoun denied these liberal notions uh, that any group that could organize itself into some sort of secession movement had a right to break off. And uh, so we could see that Calhoun supported secession because the states uh, had this legal right, but no part of a state, that is the county within the state of Alabama, for example, could not break off. Why? Because it doesn't have a right to self-determination. The people in some region of the state don't have a right to self-determination. They lack the contractual rights in the U.S. government to break off and form their own government, so they therefore secession isn't allowed to them. You can find this in other groups, too. I noticed uh, I, I compared Calhoun to some of the Hungarian leaders uh, who wanted to break off from the, from the Austrian Empire. Hungary wanted their own independent government, but Hungary also didn't want to grant self-determination to the Croats and other ethnic minorities within the hung within the kingdom of Hungary. So there are plenty of people who support secession to benefit their own regime or their own idea of who should be in charge, uh, or they might base their idea of secession on some legal right. But that should not be confused with the libertarian slash classical liberal right of self-determination, which is much broader and goes much deeper. It's a fundamental human right. And so I, I make that distinction so that people don't just start looking for historical examples of any sort of breakaway regime or country that's split into two and therefore think, oh yeah, this, this clearly then is what libertarians and classical liberals are aspiring to do. Uh, there is a right to secession, but not everybody recognizes it and not every secessionist recognizes that you have that right, which is why they, they want secession for themselves, but not for you. And that's a common thing that happens historically. Mm -hmm. So, but I mean, that is interesting though, that at least in the case of Calhoun, you're saying, you know, he, he was making arguments about U.S. states, like when, the, I guess what, saying when they joined the union, they of course were not going to forever renounce their ability to leave if they felt that was, you know, in their interest and so forth, or that the federal government wasn't living up to its end of the bargain. Um, so that's why he was saying like, no, it's, this isn't like a revolutionary or illegal act. This is, you know, they have the right to do this. Whereas, yeah. 10 guys can't just tell the mayor, you know, screw off. We're going to go form our own little city because th that's nowhere written in the statutes. How, how could you do that? Right. The legality of it was very important in Calhoun's case. Mm. And uh, it, it was it was totally different from, say, the United States secession from the United Kingdom, which was clearly an illegal act. And the Americans had no contractual right to do this. And it just comes in, and that's a fine example. There, uh, I would agree actually with Calhoun on that interpretation of the U.S. Constitution, mm -hmm. uh, but I would certainly disagree that the right to secede, that the right of self determination ends there. Uh, that there's no reason why a portion of a state can't break off because I'm I'm a classical liberal slash libertarian, and Calhoun was not. Right. Uh, so that's there's a fundamental difference there, it, and it is interesting. I, I don't know how, if you really tried to ponder as to like why this is the case, but for it seems like there's a lot of people who are re it really is important to them about the right of you know the uh, the consent of the governed. Put it that way. Like I think most people nowadays, if you said to them, "Is that a principle that should be upheld?" They would say, "Oh yes, of course." Like other you know, what's the opposite? That's tyranny, right? And and it's certainly when you if you ask people, "Do you support democracy?" Most people say yes, or at least in the West. And then why? And if you listen to what they, I'm sure, like, well, because it's got to be the will of the people. And da, da, da. and so then, yeah, okay, so therefore, if this group over here wants to leave because they don't feel like the central authority represents their will and they don't consent to it, should they be allowed to do that? And yet I think a lot of people, especially if they're progressive leftists, their default answer would be no, of course not. And so, I don't know, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, there's an idea that democracy just solves every problem. That, oh, we have some disagreements about how group A is governed. Well, we'll just let 
groups A, B, and C vote on it, and and however that vote turns out, well, then group A just has to submit to the rule of the majority. I mean, that's essentially what the, if you're relying on democracy to solve all of your issues, then you're essentially taking a majoritarian approach, but majoritarianism doesn't always work. Uh, and this is what all the liberals going back to Locke and Jefferson recognized is that, uh, yeah, having a vote on something is going to support the majority. Uh, and the United States, of course, in uh, the 18th century, that is the colonies, they didn't have any, even if they had representation in parliament, let's just imagine that it's, it's 1780, the colonies have representatives in parliament that are proportional to the population of uh, the colonies. Well, they still wouldn't have had a majority in parliament. They still would have just been at the, the mercy of, a, of, of people living in other parts of the empire. And they would have had no say in self-rule on those issues. And so you can think about just any small minority within a group. And this is why Mises was so much in favor of self-determination and secession, is he recognized that in any large state, it could be, you know, even in a small and medium-sized state, but mostly it's a bigger problem in large states, you have... You have minority groups. They could be linguistic minorities, cultural minorities, religious minorities, any number of ways that these people could be separate from the majority. And the fact of the matter is, is that over the long term, uh, the majority group wins. And it's, it is not, this does not uh, uh, solve the problem of, of also, well, we'll just have judges decide. So this is how, like, modern Americans think of it, is that, oh, well, we protect the minority because we have a, a, a checks and balance system and we have federal judges that protect the minority from the majority. In the longer term, that doesn't work either because who appoints the judges? Where do the judges come from? The judges are appointed by the democratic sides of the government. They're, they're appointed by the president with approval of the Senate. Those are all elected by majoritarian vote. And over time, the majority then will also impose its values on the judiciary. So, of course, then, over time, the judges themselves reflect the will of the majority. So, yeah, in the very short term, you might have uh, some judges that are still holding to a now out-of-fashion ideology among the Democratic majority. But over time, as, as judges die, as they resign, they're going to be replaced by people who are supported by the majority because that's who appoints them. That's where they come from. That's who educates the judges. And so this idea that somehow minority groups can be indefinitely supported from the majority is just, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't work out and it hasn't been shown to work in the real world. And the only check on that then is to allow these minority groups to be able to break off and govern themselves. And this is why Mises knew that linguistic minorities in certain countries, the only way they would have their rights truly protected and where they wouldn't be uh, second-class citizens in the medium and long term was if they were able to, at the very least, have self-rule within some sort of larger confederation. But failing that, then just complete and total separation and secession. And he was a wholehearted radical supporter of secession this way because he supported uh, what's called the uh, the pure plebiscite theory of secession, which is basically you get any sort of group of people together and they take a vote, they have a plebiscite, they say, yes, we're in favor of secession. Well, then they now get their own country. That's, of course, this is Mises' view. It's a very radical view. Uh, even among many modern day people who lean in favor of secession think that's a super radical view, but that's where Mises was. And that generally reflects the overall historical view of, of these more radical classical liberals as well. Well, good lot that there. Let me, before we unpack that a bit, just to circle back, what's, again, what's, what's funny is something you said. You're right, Ryan, that I th again, in the U.S. context, I think a lot of people, in fairness, as, as people are worried about like Donald Trump winning the presidency again, there are more people on the left saying, well, gee, it'd be kind of cool if California could just break away and be its own. Co so I, I don't want to paint with too broad a brush here, but I think, you know, in recent years, the default position, yeah, like if you heard, oh, a bunch of people in Texas want to break away because they think the federal government is overbearing and their taxes are too high, they would say, boo-hoo, tough luck. You know, we have a constitutional system. Go vote for a different Congress and president if you don't like it. 
these are the rules. You know, you don't just get to leave when you're down losing the game or something. But yet those same people, if African countries wanted to break away from the British Empire, that obviously, like that was a tremendous, one of the worst injustices in human history was the, the colonial era, you know, of you know, British rule and other European rule of African nations. And so you w- it wouldn't have placated them to say, well, no, what if we just made sure that, you know, those people had a vote and they, you know, they had a constitutional procedures, like whether it was a written or unwritten constitution, you know what I mean? Yeah, they wouldn't be happy. No, they'd say, no, these people want to have their own country. This is crazy. And so, again, I mean, I'm just kind of repeating my original question, Ryan, but is it just boiled down to if it's people they like and they like they like they support the reasons for their unhappiness, then yes, they should be able to break away. Whereas if they think like, no, you should pay more taxes. What are you talking about? Then you don't get to leave. Yeah, it, it, this impulse from people who are in favor in a central government is always in favor of centralization. And it's in controlling everybody within the current borders, however drawn. And that's a point I make uh, in the book, Breaking Away, and also in a number of subsequent articles, is the exact same arguments that we hear from people saying, oh, just vote harder or do some activism, and then you can, uh, that's how your rights will be protected don't even think about breaking away. These are the same sorts of arguments that colonialists always made, is that, oh, well, you, you can't break off because uh, we, we as, as the central government, we help ensure your rights. If we allow this group to break off, well, they'll just fight each other. They don't know how to rule themselves. They don't, they don't know how to engage in self-government. They need some sort of oversight from the center uh, because people in London, Washington, Paris, wherever, are more enlightened. And, and the, it's our constitutional system that governs things uh, in a, uh, a, a way that protects rights. There's, there's always this drive to ensure that people who are currently under our rule can't go off and do their own thing because we assume they'll do things worse. Yes, we admit our system isn't perfect, but if you go off and start your own country, you're going to do things much worse. Uh, whereas, right, we'll protect your rights here now. Now, of course, the, the people who want to break away, they don't think you're doing a sufficient job of protecting your rights. That's why they want to break away. Uh, but apparently just having an opinion in that minority group is not sufficient. You have to stay inside. And uh, and the uh, example that I think we can keep coming back to is uh, what happened in the Soviet Union after it broke up. Uh, yes, there was all that decolonization that happened after World War II. And a point should be made, by the way, that at the end of World War II, anytime someone talks about, oh, secession is very rare and uh, it's, it's, it's chaos, you can't let it happen. Well, at the end of World War II, there were only about 85 countries in the world, and nowadays there are over 190. Well, how did you? How did we end up with all of those extra countries? Because the From Earth secession. expanded, right? <laughs> right. The surface of the Earth did not yeah. get any bigger. We had floating cities, and <laughs> it happened, of course, through secession. A bunch of countries broke off into smaller pieces. That's what happened, and most people are fine with that. Most people are fine with decolonization. But decolonization happened again. Uh, there was a new wave of it after 1991. Uh, when all these post-Soviet countries seceded and created their own countries. And this is especially notable in the Baltic states, so Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. And of course, uh, of relevance today, again, is Ukraine. All of these countries seceded. And there's no way to argue that the way the Baltics seceded was legal in any way. These were clearly illegal secessions. The Ukrainian secession also arguably completely illegal. It's just that the, the regime... Uh, international pressure was so clear that once the Ukrainians voted to secede, the Soviets weren't willing to do anything about it. But it's also needs to be noted that those people who argue, well, you should just vote, uh, and the Baltics were allowed to secede because they uh, they didn't have a vote. Well, the reality is they were offered. They were offered a Republican constitution uh, at the end of the Soviet Union. The idea at the Soviet Union was to rewrite their constitution so they would no longer be the union of Soviet socialist republics. They would be a union of independent republics. And they, they created what was called the New Union Treaty. And uh, Gorbachev's plan then was to, we'll have the Baltics, we'll have the Ukrainians and these other republics from the old Soviet Union. We'll all be in this big democratic republic, similar to the United States. And you'll all get to vote on it. Well, that was a trick, which, of course, the Ukrainians and the Baltics weren't going to fall for because they recognized that they would just be small minorities 
within this group. They could see that the uh, other ethnic groups were going to constitute a majority. And you would be nuts then to be a Latvian and decide to stay in even a constitutional republic uh, that constituted the populations of the old Soviet Union. Because, well, you were always going to be outvoted. It didn't matter whether you had some Bill of Rights or something. Overall, eventually, the majority would assert its control. And your, your small minority of one or two million people, it was going to be meaningless. And you were going to be in a state of permanent minority. And that's, that's really what leads to secession and the need for secession, too, is just imagine if you're any group in America where you realize then that you're not going to win any more national elections. If there's some group in America that thought that was pinning its hopes for its, its future ability to protect its rights on winning future national elections, that, okay, well, sometimes the Dems are in charge and they don't reflect our views, but at least sometimes our side uh, is in the White House. At least sometimes we're in the major majority. Uh, we're willing to accept that. So we'll just stay in this union. But what happens when you get to the point where you suspect that you're never going to win these elections again, that you're never going to be in the majority again? Well, then what do you get from being within that government? You don't get anything. Voting harder it won't get you anything. So then the only real strategy for protecting your rights, for asserting any sort of self-ruled independence would come from secession and other more mild forms of self-determination like local self-rule, maybe under just a single regime for purposes of foreign policy or something like that. But obviously, if you're in a perpetual minority state, then voting in, in the Senate, uh, voting for president or whatever, that just never avails you anything. So the peaceful solutions at that point uh, are, are no longer helpful, no longer useful, which by the way, is why another reason that Mises supported secession, he thought it helped avoid civil wars and, and violent conflict. And he was right. Okay. Yeah. So again, a lot there, a, a quick thing too, it's, it's not merely that, uh, oh, if you think like, like certain people in the U S right now could say, yeah, we, we don't think our, we're ever going to be in the majority wind. Many of them could, whether plausibly or not could think no our guy actually did win and they just cheated and so you know what i mean like so it's not even that like oh you guys lost fair and square and then well i don't like this game anymore because no i'm not winning it's like well no if it seems like the umpires and everybody are all in on it and, and throwing the game well then yeah why would i keep sitting here playing this that, that seems kind of crazy yeah that's even worse if they think that they're, <laughs> they're losing through dishonest means and you can tell them the opposite all you want. You could tell them, oh, that's misinformation. You're simply wrong. Your grievances mm -hmm. are wrong. That doesn't solve the problem. That just makes those people more angry. So if you yeah. want to avoid violence, you really should give them more self-determination. Human Action Podcast listeners, you can enter in to win free attendance to an upcoming Mises Institute event. 2024 marks the 75th anniversary of Mises' great economic treatise, Human Action. And in honor of this occasion, the Mises Institute is holding a special conference on May 16th through the 18th. Scholars from around the world will be there, including Guido Holzman, Bob Murphy, Joe Salerno, Tom DiLorenzo, and more. Visit Mises.org slash HA Raffle to enter into a drawing for free admission to the event. If you're a student, scholarships are also available at Mises.org slash HA24. Now back to the action. So, Ryan, just to play devil's advocate here, uh, so I think everyone knows, but I'm a big fan of secession, and you know, I've written a pamphlet saying that I think Texas independence is the only thing that can help this, you know, our our country right now to avoid civil war and, and ma you know maintain a, at least a remnant of freedom. Uh, but I could imagine back going back to what we were talking about five minutes ago, Ryan. Couldn't somebody who is let, let's say like a a sort of right wing U.S. conservative type you know, National Review kind of guy, fan of William F. Buckley, like that sort of a person, couldn't he have been listening to what you were saying five or 10 minutes ago and say, yeah, I don't think the U.S. should break up. It's, you know, USA is awesome. We, we Let's not throw in the towel. But also the people who were, the colonialists who were saying if the African nations break away, it's going to be chaos and, you know, a bloodbath in the true sense, not the Trumpian sense of auto uh, sales. Didn't history kind of prove them right? Like, actually, so what would you say to something like that? Well, that, of course, is the imperialist view, right? Mm -hmm. Is that we have a white man's burden to rule over these places. 
and uh, control them and ensure that uh, they don't engage in uh, any of the chaos that that would that would uh, happen after we, that is the imperialists, leave them to their own devices. There's a couple problems with this. One is that, well, uh, <laughs> the humanitarian intervention, right? That's that's what they're saying is that we should have a permanent humanitarian intervention intervention in all of these African countries or for India, whatever. Uh, otherwise, they'll kill themselves, uh, and that's the. That's the uh, justification given today when the United States essentially de facto colonizes other countries. Uh, Iraq for 20 years, Afghanistan for 20 years, uh, saying that uh, the United States needs to go into all of these different Latin American countries and take over. Otherwise, these people will kill themselves. Uh, these are violations, of course, of international law. They don't respect the sovereignty of other people. And it's just simple, old-fashioned colonialism, and it's no different from the white people uh, simply, simply stealing all the land from Indians in North America and saying, well, they're much better off now because uh, their systems, they had slaves, uh, uh, these tribes had slaves, and they, they were violent, and they didn't know how to run their own societies anyway, so uh, better for them to be under white man rule. Okay, I mean, I get why imperialists and colonialists think that way and why people, and, and I have no doubt that many people at the National Review do think that way. Uh, but as a classical liberal, as someone who supports human rights, I'm, I'm opposed to that. Mises was vehemently against colonialism uh, for a variety of reasons. So on a principled level, it's, it's wrong. However, what these people also never mention is that in order to maintain rule in these places, they're constantly perpetrating massacres and violence of various types. So in order to pacify, quote unquote, the Native Americans in North America, countless massacres had to take place in order to teach these people how to live. In Africa, countless massacres took place. Uh, what happens is they tend to be smaller scale, but they add up over time. And that's all to ensure that these people in these African countries uh, don't kill each other, will kill them to make sure that they don't kill each other. And of course, Churchill was in, in support of all those sorts of things. Uh, he had no problem with massacring Kenyans and any other group that got in the way of his imperialist uh, ideals. And uh, Churchill is, of course, always fun to bring up because when the Nazis were conquering other countries, Churchill was always going off on the right of self-determination of Europeans. But once the war was over, they said, hey, doesn't self-determination apply to uh, people in the British Empire? It's like, no, no. Uh, Asians and Africans, they're exempt from self-determination. They don't have that. And so he even recognized there was a right of self-determination. You just didn't get it if you were one of these racial inferiors that uh, Churchill didn't accept as full-blown human beings. And that's essentially the philosophy behind centralization, behind state building, behind a refusal to let anyone secede, is it need not be based on race, but it is based on the idea that people who are outside of your central regime simply can't be allowed to do things or they'll just be nonstop massacres. The reality, of course, is that in order to maintain the, the status quo, these people aren't afraid to per perpetrate their own massacres and history have shown that they do it on many, many occasions. Yeah. And besides some of the more famous, what like, uh, if people have never checked out, just go read the Wikipedia article on King Leopold II of Belgium. And he's got some fun, fun stuff involved with his, uh, his, his involvement in that region. Um, okay. So very good there. Now you mentioned the Ukrainian situation and this is something you brought up in your talk that they, uh, the U S I don't know if it was the, like NATO in general, but they opposed Ukrainian independence at the time? Yeah, the Bush administration uh, in a, uh, what's now called a, <laughs> the Chicken Kiev. Speech. And this is the H.W. Bush? Uh, yes, the old Bush. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, him and the State Department and the CIA and all of that, they didn't really want the Soviet Union to break up at all. And to, to get a sense of what was going on at that time, you, you could read some of the articles that Rothbard wrote at the time when the Baltics were breaking off and when uh, Czechoslovakia was breaking in two, uh, also another peaceful secession movement you should look up, uh, where they, they just took a, 
they took a vote in parliament and they decided we're going to secede and we're going to start a new country. This was also opposed by the U.S. government and by their friends at the New York Times. The idea was the secession of Ukraine, of the Slovaks, of the Baltics, it's, it's driven by nationalism. This was the propaganda line at the time was nationalism is bad. And if we let these people have their own countries, uh, Europe is going to be fueled by uh, fanatical nationalism. And there's going to be all of this butchery of uh, ethnic minorities within all of these countries. And, and the bloodshed will be unbelievable. Whereas if we keep all these countries together, there will be these checks and balances and rights will be protected. So the idea was that the Ukrainians were better protected if they stayed within the Soviet Union. And uh, that's why Bush made that speech. Uh, the Ukrainians did not listen to him and they seceded anyway. And the United States eventually accepted what was just reality. Can I just stop you? Right? Are you saying th this is not on my radar? So George H.W. Bush, there's a speech we could probably go find some more where he's opposing Ukrainian or Balkan yeah, independence. The, the chicken Kiev speech. Uh, okay is what it's called. Back okay. when we called it Kiev, K-I-E-V. Okay. They haven't changed. It's not now the chicken Kiev speech. They've, gotcha. they've maintained the old name. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, he basically lectures the Ukrainians on how wrong they are to want their own independent country. Uh, and that gives you a good sense of what was going on in the, in the U.S. thinking uh, at the time. So, but it was all based on this idea of nationalism. Now, I think that the real motivation was Washington has always liked uh, just a fewer number of governments that they can deal with and right. they're, they're not particularly concerned with human rights mm -hmm. or self-determination or any of that sort of thing. But they never really signed off or encouraged all of these countries that are now in NATO in which the United States has made its peace with its uh, their independence and, and the, the, the regime has become very anti-Russia. So now it likes independence for all these countries. Mm -hmm. But 30 years ago, it hated the idea and was definitely opposed, as was Washington Post, New York Times, yeah, and all I, those friends of the regime. Yeah, just on that, Ryan, I saw some documentary, I don't know, a year or two ago. And I, I, obviously, you could they could say anything they want. It seemed pretty even-handed. It didn't seem like the, the maker of the documentary had an axe to grind or anything. It just and interviewing people who were, like, in other words, the unraveling of the Soviet Union in real time and, and sort of talking to people who were there in the Bush. And they were sort of like, they didn't see it coming, and then they were kind of panicked. And I think part of it was just, well, you know, we we can deal with these people now. Like we like with Gorbachev or whatever, or then um, with Boris Yeltsin. You know, like these are people we can deal with, and we and it's nice and predictable. Whereas if it starts unraveling, we can't control the world anymore. Like we don't know what's going to happen next Thursday, and so does that's partly just the default. We don't like change because hey, we're we're kind of running the world right now, and this is pretty good from our point of view, and we don't like a massive. Uh, upset to that system. Yeah, Lou Rockwell has said in passing more than once. <laughs> he says, go back and look at the video footage of those very early days when uh, the Soviet Union is basically announcing that the Cold War is over, that uh, that the Berlin Wall is falling. He says, if you look at the faces of all these uh, State Department types, the CIA types, they all look like they want to vomit. They just yeah. look so unhappy uh, because it's for all the reasons you just said. A new world is a, is a, is a born-in, and it's something that the CIA hadn't planned for or predicted, and so they didn't know what to do, and they don't like that sort of instability. Um, okay, so why don't we move into like some of the ob objections now, just to give you time, you know, in the, what have we got, 15 minutes or something left here. So... And this is going to dovetail with what you just kind of talked about. But one big one is, oh, the reason we don't, or or even a classical liberal type, and I know there are many libertarians in the U.S. context who don't like, you know, the sort of Mises Institute wing of the movement, let's call it. And you guys are all about secession all the time, but we'll know because right now with everybody in this giant polity, the, the good sense and fairness of the whole nation kind of prevents any localized oppression, but if you allowed this and different states to splinter off, then there would be more oppression. You know, it might be different types. Like maybe in Cal if, if California forms its own nation, maybe they just start confiscating millionaires' houses. And, you know, but if Texas breaks away, maybe, you know, if a woman gets caught getting an abortion, she goes to jail for 10 years and, uh, you know, black people can't go to public school anymore. You know, who knows what would happen if we didn't have the federal government kind of keeping everybody fair. So you've already kind of addressed that a little bit, like with the Soviet Union, it's kind of laughable to say, oh, the reason we need to keep people in the Soviet Union is to make sure there's not wide-scale oppression, like 
that doesn't exactly seem like a sensible thing to say, but can you just speak to that that complaint? Yeah, there's two two ways that I generally approach this objection. Um, one is that it goes in both directions, right? If local rule is more inclined to violate people's rights, then why not have world government? Uh, if independent Texas is just going to be horrible and there's no way to actually provide checks and balances, there's no higher up uh, expert court to force this local entity to uh, abide by some notion of human rights, well, then shouldn't we have an international court that forces the United States to abide by global views of human rights and humanitarian intervention then? Why is it, why have we stumbled upon miraculously just the right exact type of federalism and just the right amount of localization. So you're allowed an independent, totally sovereign independent country as long as it's the United States, but anything smaller than that is just gonna be a nightmare for human rights. Well, mm -hmm. how come it doesn't ever go up the ladder? Only the most, only most extreme world government people argue, well, the United States can't be trusted. Why should we trust the United States Supreme Court to protect rights? Obviously we can't trust the Texas Supreme Court to protect rights because we hear that all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, why is the US Supreme Court magically just the right size government to protect rights? Why shouldn't the United States be in a global confederation where there is a global Supreme Court to protect rights all the more? What, won't rights be even better protected then when they have to go through an additional layer of checks and balances? I'm not sure why that's not something that's acceptable to these people. Uh, and so I would like to, I, I've actually haven't gotten a response. Why is it the United States gets sovereignty, but Texas doesn't get sovereignty? If you need a higher level of government to force correct uh, adherence to human rights, I don't see why the United States is not also local. Of course, it's a, it's a, it's a state localized to its particular part of the world. And to argue that the United States government does not oppress people is just laughable at this point. Um, seems to me like we need a global government then that could offer an additional layer. Um, so I, that seems to make perfect logical sense to me if you're going to argue that a local republic cannot protect rights. And then, of course, the other argument is that when we talk about what counts as an acceptable government, well, generally, when you're talking to people in the left, when we're talking about the rest of the world, anything that would be modeled on a U.S. state would clearly pass muster for them as an acceptable liberal government. So here, we're gonna create in Africa a government that has regular elections every two years. It has a House of Representatives. It has a Senate, it has a bicameral legislature. It has a chief executive elected by the full population. And it has a Supreme Court for that country. Uh, here's the constitution. It has all these three branches of government. It has a Supreme Court. It even has a bill of rights. You would, your typical American progressive or leftist would say, yes, that is, ex that is a great democratic country we now have there. They have that constitution. That is a wonderful, perfectly reasonable democratic constitution. Oh, but that same constitution, we're going to put that in uh, the state of Georgia. So now don't they get a right to have self-rule just like that, that African country that has an identical constitution? No, 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 no. No, Georgia can't be allowed because that's not democratic. You see, because uh, an American state using a democratic constitution that way, that's not democracy. Even though in African country, they use an identical constitution. That is democracy. So you see how every state in the union, uh, which except Nebraska, which has a unicameral legislature, every state in the union has bicameral legislature, Supreme Court, three branches of government, all the same institutions as you would consider necessary for any democratic constitutional republic. Every state has this. And if it were in a foreign setting, all Americans would agree, yep, it's great, it's democracy. But for whatever bizarre reason, if that same <laughs> institutional setting exists within the United States, well, now those people are going to immediately, if you give them any independence, they're going to immediately institute slavery. They're going to start oppressing all their minority groups, and it's not democracy for some reason. And so I've always found it curious that what's obviously a democratic 
republic with a constitution, constitutional government, complete with the Bill of Rights, by the way. Uh, state constitutions have bills of rights. They have rights clearly outlined, many of which are actually more extensive than the U.S. Bill of Rights and better in some ways. Um, but that doesn't count for some reason. All of those democratic institutions, the Supreme Courts that are all designed to protect rights and are really based on, in many ways, a, a Madisonian model, that, that doesn't work for some reason. The, the real reason, of course, is that they just, the, the leftists who are against secession and just the people in general against secession, they're pleased with the status quo. They like the status quo. They like the people who run Washington and they want those people to have uh, control over every corner of the United States. But if they were being consistent, they would admit that, yes, these democratic constitutions in all of these states, of course, that's democracy. And of course, if it were used in uh, Brazil, if it were used in uh, Algeria, it would be fine. And we would all recognize it as perfectly acceptable government institutions. And even so that, that's a great point, uh, Ryan. I've, I've never actually heard that particular argument before. That's a good one. I'm going to add that to my arsenal. Um, and you could even make it you know, more specific and say, cause you know, like, like Putin just got reelected by a big margin. And I understand like the jokes going around, like, Oh, wow, that was a, that was a nail biter. You know what I mean? Like, we don't think that that really was a fair election. So, um, likewise here, like you could actually get more specific and, and say, come up with whatever criteria or metrics to say, even though on paper, they have a bicameral legislature, is it actually legit? You know what I mean? And, and whatever met metrics you want to use clearly, like you're saying, if some, South American or African nation performed as well on those metrics as Georgia or Texas or whatever, you know, that would be an, an A plus in their book. Like, and if there were some neighboring big state or some European power that said, oh, no, 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 we got to kind of administer them and, and have a custodial relationship because clearly that would be outrageous. That'd be colonialism. What do you And they would all see through that and say, no, 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 you just want to dominate them. And yet, as you're saying, in this context, if Washington, D.C. says, well, we can't let them go because think of the poor uh, single teen moms who would be oppressed, then, you, you know, how come they can't see through that? And so anyway, the good, good point. I can um, just real quick, Ryan, you mentioned a few minutes ago that you'd never seen a good response to your argument about, well, well gee, if, you know, if breaking the U.S. up into smaller countries is bad, why is the current U.S. the rights, the optimal size? How come? And, and you didn't know what the response was. That let me let me tell you, I recently encountered one. So on this very podcast, we, I gave like an hour and fifteen minute rebuttal to James Lindsay, who had written against Texas. Well, more generally, the uh, national divorce. Okay, so he wasn't just focusing on Texas, and that was one of his arguments was, oh, if the U.S. breaks up, you know, that's just what Klaus Schwab wants. It makes the Chinese communists now are are better able to dominate the world if the U.S. breaks it. And so then I said this thing in my rebuttal. I said, among other arguments, well, well gee, if, if the if it you know the U.S. if Texas breaking away would weaken the U.S. military and then Taiwan and Hong Kong are in trouble, why stop there? Shouldn't the U.S. join with Canada and Mexico? We'll have a bigger GDP, a bigger navy, and then we'll be better able to defend Taiwan and Hong Kong from the, the Chinese, right? So. Would James favor that? And you know, and he he did acknowledge my video. You, you know what his response was? He retweeted, you know, the meet the Mises post and said LLL. That was his response. <laughs> so anyway, well, I, I just if people said, Bob, you you haven't let that go yet? No, I have not. Not yet. Nor should you. I mean, that was yeah. an excellent question that demands a response. Uh, and yeah. It, well, it just comes down to nationalism also just in reverse is we're Americans. We can govern ourselves. We count as people who deserve an independent country. Texans don't count. And that's interestingly, that's the argument that Putin makes right now about Ukraine. Mm. Well, the, their history is our history. They don't count as a separate people. So therefore, they don't get their own government. Uh, so. Here we are again, making colonialist arguments, and that's what it usually comes down to. Okay, one last one in the last, I guess we got like five minutes here before, uh, you know, I, I booked you for it in case you got to go. Uh, you, I don't know if you actually got to it in your talk, but you had said at the outset you wanted to talk about what happens with a country that has nuclear weapons that, you know, the central government does, and then people are breaking apart or, or regions are breaking apart. What, what, what do you say to that particular issue? 
Yes, I did get to that at, right at the very end, like the last 10 minutes of the talk. And, uh, well, I just delved into the history again, right? And, and do we have historical examples of a nuclear power breaking up into smaller pieces? And then what happened? And we do. Uh, when Ukraine seceded from the Soviet Union, that made Ukraine the number three nuclear power in the world. Uh, because when it was the Soviet Union, Soviet Union had uh, at least, probably significantly more, at least 5,000 nuclear warheads at the time. The United States presently has about 5,000. Um, uh, there's been some ratcheting down since the end of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're back down to about around 5,000, but it was even much higher at some point. Uh, so Ukraine had over 1,000 of their own uh, in Ukraine's territory. And Ukraine, stupidly, in my opinion, uh, d decided it was going to denuclearize. Why? They didn't have any reason to. They, uh, they considered the Soviets a potential enemy. Uh, had they not denuclearized, uh, we would probably not be looking at um, uh, the war that we're currently looking at in the Ukraine. There's about a 0% chance that the Russians would have uh, attempted to invade Kiev as they did a couple of years ago and try to topple the regime. It was pretty clearly a, a initial uh, objective of that war. Trying to, uh, trying to topple and decapitate a nuclear regime is insane, crazy talk, because uh, that's when the nukes fly. So it would have been a totally different uh, situation for Ukraine. That's slightly different issue. Just wanted to note that, though. Mm -hmm. um, but so Ukraine, yep, here they are. Suddenly they find themselves in 1993 with a bunch of nukes. The Soviets um, do not have access at this point to the nukes within Ukraine. Now, there's some, uh, we want to get down to the real nuts and bolts in it. There's some nuance to that. First of all, if you had a nuclear armed plane within Ukraine, well, now that's controlled by Ukraine. You had a nuclear armed subs that happened to be in Ukrainian territory, that's now easily controlled by the Ukraine regime because these are physical things that they can control and simply turn off the ability uh, to launch. What they do have to do, though, is rewrite the software and obtain control of the nukes uh, in terms of launch codes and that sort of thing. That was most uh, important in terms of the land-based nukes. Uh, so you do have, of course, those um, uh, silos that were in Ukrainian mm -hmm. territory. Now, some Did they had to make copies of the two keys that you got to put in <laughs> with the two different officers? Well, in 1980s nuclear war movies, that's how it always works. Yeah. I'm not... <laughs> I'm not sure how it worked yeah. in the Soviet Union at the they time. They just ran, ran down to uh, a, a Home Depot and said, quick, hurry up before uh, Vlad sees, uh, sees us here. There's, yeah. you, you flip up that panel and you push the red yeah. button. <laughs> I, that is something that had to be addressed, those sorts yeah. of issues, actually, because there were human beings in these bunkers. Now, I, I heard somebody attempted just a few months ago to make a really lame claim that, uh, that the Ukrainians never obtained control of the land-based nukes because the Russians inside the bunkers refused to come out, which is nonsense. Uh, as soon as the Russians in the bunkers stopped getting paid, they stopped manning the bunkers. Uh, these guys were not going to sit in there for some weird nationalist reason and just hole up and, and eat granola bars in the bunkers for years, uh, hoping that it all worked out in some pro-Russian way. No, the the Ukrainians, of course, immediately had control of the areas surrounding the bunkers. And then as soon as the money and food ran out and sort of the bunkers, the guys came out and then Ukrainians went into the bunkers and had physical control of the bunkers. At the time of denuclearization in Ukraine, the Ukrainians were writing new software so that they could also reprogram the launch codes and take control of the nuclear arsenal in every way within their border. Uh, unfortunately for Ukraine, what happened is the United States intervened and the United States has long been... Uh, devoted to this idea of uh, anti-nuclear proliferation. The United States wants as few countries as possible for some of the reasons that you noted in terms of why the, country, the, the, the U.S. wants as few regimes as possible. Mm -hmm. They want as few nuclear armed countries as possible. They find that's easier to manage, even though there's no actual evidence that proliferation leads to nuclear war. Uh, and, of course, proliferation has occurred without U.S. knowledge, uh, as in the case of Pakistan. That just happened, and the United States did not know this was about to happen. Uh, so the U.S. is just against proliferation. So they told Ukraine, well, we'll guarantee your safety in an informal way. There's no real treaty saying this. Uh, we'll guarantee your safety if you, if you get rid of all of your nukes. So the Ukrainians fell for it, and they did it, and they handed over their nukes. However... 
uh, this was not an easy process and the Ukrainians, there was deep seated uh, uh, ethnic tensions, language differences, lots of bad blood between the Ukrainians for things like the Holodomor and, you know, mass starvation and things like that, uh, that the Ukrainians were mad about. Uh, because of the things the Soviets did to them and that the Russian majority had done to them in the past. But this provides us of a peaceful transfer of nuclear arms in the case of a nuclear power splitting up in spite of an environment that actually was very, very prone to conflict and likely to lead to war, you would think. But it turned out that in the aftermath that the that some of the denuclearized power, Kazakhstan, by the way, uh, had some nuclear arms as well and chose also to denuclearize uh, not nearly the volume as in Ukraine. So there we go. We have an example right there of a country that was basically in chaos when these countries started breaking off. And, ne and for reasons that are actually explained in my uh, chapter in the book about it, there was never the suitcase bomb situation. This is what anti-proliferation people are always going on and on about as well. If you have some sort of secession, there's the, the, the countries are going to start selling nukes to terrorists and all this. There are many good reasons why, yeah, as a breakaway country, you don't want to start selling your nukes. Because, first of all, you have no guarantee they won't be used against you. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that just didn't happen. And why would, why would we think it would be worse in the United States? We have every reason to believe it would be more orderly and less prone to conflict in the United States, this idea that uh, were Florida to break off from the United States and there were some silos there, or maybe some nukes in port in Florida, that the Floridians are going to uh, take advantage of their deep-seated uh, ethnic tensions with the regime in Washington, D.C. and with the North to just let the nukes fly and hope that it all works out at the end. There's zero reason to believe this would happen. Deterrence works in post-secession countries just as well as it works for anywhere else. And I go deep into a lot of the, um, the international relations scholarship on this, uh, even some of the game theory that looks at this. And so that's just not really a convincing argument and to simply just do some hand waving and say well there can never be secession in any country that's nuclear armed because it will immediately lead to nuclear war uh, we have examples of the contrary uh, so they would need to explain to me why uh, the new republic of texas would want to in contrary to what every other nuclear power has ever done just start a nuclear war uh, with another nuclear power. Uh, it, they're going to have to explain to me why that's the case and why that overrides the right of self-determination of whatever country it is that wants to uh, break off. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are answers to these questions. Uh, you just need to look them up and look at the history of denuclearization, nuclear, nuclear uh, tinged secession, that sort of thing. We have examples. Okay, great. And remind folks, what's the title of your book? Uh, the book is Breaking Away, the case for uh, secession, radical decentralization, and smaller polities. You can get it on Amazon, you can get it through the Mises Bookstore, or you can get it online at Mises.org. There's an audio book and there's a PDF version. You can certainly read it and listen to it for free. Okay, great. So yeah, so folks, I'll for this episode of the Human Action Podcast, I'll link to Ryan's recent talk at Oklahoma State on secession, and of course to his book that the Mises Institute put out. So uh, Ryan, thanks so much for your uh, time and insights, as always. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We're glad you're interested in these esoteric topics because we think they're actually very important for the future of liberty. We'll see you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.